everyone, I'm Tanya Bryer and welcome to CNBC Conversation. I'm here at the One Young World Conference in Dublin to meet the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan. We'll be discussing with him how he's helping the youth of today and also his views on some of the most troubling humanitarian crises facing our global community. Born in Ghana in 1938, he became one of the most recognisable faces of international politics, leading the United Nations through a period that saw resolutions defied and the organisation's very existence questioned. We must all feel that this is a sad day for the United Nations and the international community. I know that millions of people around the world share this sense of disappointment and are deeply alarmed by the prospect of imminent war. But despite opposition by some of the organization's most powerful member states, Kofi Annan is credited with coordinating peacekeeping for dozens of civil and international conflicts and overseeing the adoption of the UN's first ever counter-terrorism strategy and the Human Rights Council. But perhaps the Secretary General's most heralded undertaking was his push to reform the UN itself. The newly introduced measures saw him and the organization win the Nobel Peace Prize in 2001. All of us who work for the United Nations should be proud today, but also be humbled. Humbled because even more will be expected of us in the future. After leaving his role amid controversy in 2006, standing down didn't mean standing back. At 76 years old, Annan continues to be a vocal proponent of UN reform and is now inspiring a new generation of leaders. I think he's a very wise person. He had courage in taking on some issues that were extraordinarily difficult. It was unusual for somebody like that to become Secretary General. There is a laser-like brain in operation and he seduces you. He really does um, move the needle. I think he was the most popular um, of the uh, UN Secretary Generals. Probably the most effective. Mr Annan, thank you so much for joining me on CNBC Conversation. I'm very happy to be here with you. Yeah. We're here at One Young World in Dublin. How important do you think are events like these to empower the youth of today? I think it's extremely important to bring the youth together and to challenge them, encourage them uh, to take responsibility, encourage them to engage, encourage them to lead if they wish. I've, I've always told them one is never too young to lead. It's something in you which comes out and you have to listen to that inner drama, follow your inner compass and, and react. And the young people today, quite a lot of them are very good leaders. Well, we'll talk more about your many humanitarian initiatives a little bit later on. You spent over 44 years at the United Nations, yeah. nearly a decade as yeah. Secretary General. What do you feel most proud of during your tenure there? I think one of the areas I was very pleased about was to open up the UN and bring the UN closer to the people, bringing in civil society to the organization, private sector, because it was very clear that uh, if we are going to do all the things we have set ourselves, we needed partners, we needed to reach out. I was also very happy about the uh, the Millennium Development Goals. Mr. Annan, I have also read about what you felt were your biggest regrets there, yeah. and one of them being the failing to stop the genocide yeah. in, in Rwanda, the massacre at Srebrenica, and also not being able to stop the war um, in Iraq yeah. in 2003. Yeah. How do these momentous events, conflicts, affect you? No, it, uh, it, uh, it's heart-wrenching, and it affects an individual, even just to see one person at risk, one person killed, hurts, and, and you, you bleed. But when you see it on that scale, and um, ask yourself, how could this happen in today's world? With Rwanda 
And Srebrenica was uh, uh, the head of the peacekeeping yes. operations. I wasn't the secretary general then. I had a boss. But uh, when you go on the ground and you see what happens in Srebrenica, this is why I felt the lessons had to be learned. And of course, we had Iraq, where as secretary general, I, I worked very hard yeah. with other governments to try and stop it, uh, or at least make sure that if it is going to happen, the United Nations Security Council endorses it. You were talking just now about the reverberation from the Iraq war, and of course it's the Islamic State and the onslaught of violence in that area. You were sent in 2012 by yes, the United correct. Nations and the League of Arab States as a special envoy, yes, and you resigned months later. Six months later, yeah. Why, why did you resign? I think uh, it, it became uh, obvious to, right from the beginning. I told the Security Council, this is a mission impossible. At the beginning, it started well. The council passed one or two resolutions. Yeah. But then things got very difficult. And as you would recall, I came up with a six-point plan. Yes. And everybody was saying, that's the only game in town. Uh, the worst were there, but the real support wasn't there in the sense that some of the follow-up action that should be taken in capitals. I think the last straw for me was uh, after the Geneva conference. Unfortunately, I could not get the key countries from the region that I wanted to participate, two of them. I wanted Saudi Arabia and Iran in the room. They were not there for different reasons. But we had Turkey, Iraq, Qatar, and uh, Kuwait. Um, and we got an agreement. But then when they got to New York and the Security Council, they started fighting again instead of focusing and pushing the substance uh, forward. Then I, I realized perhaps I was more serious about peace than those who gave me the mandate. And the mediator cannot want peace more than the protagonist. So I felt uh, it was better for me to move on. Can you blame those countries, Mr. An Anand, for the resulting violence now that we see with Islamic State and the escalation? It's, uh, I think the, the, the blame must first be on the protagonist. And the, I mean, the international community in those countries could have helped. They could have played it differently, and even today, uh, they are trying to help. What do you feel can be done to stop IS? I, I don't think you can do it uh, with military means alone. We, they need to find a political and diplomatic ways of pressuring them or their supporters uh, to work together uh, to, to bring the situation on, under control. And you need uh, not only the international community in the sense of the uh, permanent members of the council, and all, but you need the key players in the country. Uh, you need Iran, you need Saudi Arabia, you need Turkey, and you need uh, Egypt. Uh, Qatar, uh, maybe, but it has to be very sustained effort with a clear objective as to how they are going to approach uh, the issue. Would you be against boots on the ground? Uh, where would you find them? <laughs> that, that is, uh, everybody is saying yeah. we don't want to put boots on the ground. Uh, countries in the neighborhood have indicated, in fact, uh, Turkey is saying we don't want to do it alone, or oh, this must go in with us. Uh, I haven't seen any others who are volunteering to go in. The Americans, the UK, France, and others have made it clear they are not going in, and uh, none of the neighbors has uh, offered uh, to go in. So the idea is to train um, uh, about 5,000 uh, soldiers to take the fight to ISIS. Training takes time. There are other areas um, in the world of great concern. Of course, Ukraine being one of them, mm. Mr. Anand. There are sa sanctions against Russia, but in your experience of President Putin, mm -hmm. do you feel that will help or resolve anything? I don't think sanctions alone will resolve the uh, problem in Ukraine. Sanctions as such 
uh, if you are not careful, sometimes hurts the people more than the leaders whose behavior you are trying to change. My own sense is that uh, it ought to be possible to find a political solution in Ukraine, stop the killing and the fighting. And I think there are proposals on the table, including considerable autonomy for the Russian-speaking regions and minority regions, which makes sense. And I think with a concentrated and sustained negotiation, they can come to an agreement uh, on, on that. Do you think President Putin will listen, though, because he could do what he wants? He has sanctions against him. There's no military intervention. He's also proud of his country and would want to see his economy develop. He would want to see the country uh, grow. Uh, right now, there are serious economic uh, difficulties. I mean, it may not affect him personally, but it's affecting society uh, and the country. And uh, I'm sure uh, deep down it does uh, bother him and he would find a, a solution uh, and uh, he would want to find a solution and and I think um, he people we, we, I have dealt with him and others have dealt with him in other serious situations to find solutions and so I, I would say he's closed I mean one can work and find a solution with him what about the Ebola epidemic? I mm. know that you've spoken to all the heads of state mm. uh, in West Africa. Yeah. Do they feel let down? I think they feel uh, uh, let down. They think the response is uh, a bit better now. I myself was bitterly disappointed uh, that we had not responded uh, faster. In fact, in a, a statement I issued at one stage, I indicated that we should use uh, military uh, personnel because they can go in, organize, they hit the ground running. The public health system in all three countries have collapsed. So one will really have to try and revamp it and build it up very quickly uh, and at the same time treat the, uh, the sick. Are you worried that Ebola will characterize Africa in a negative image? Yeah, I think uh, first of all, the. The press has to be very clear that Africa is a huge continent. So far, it's three countries that we are focusing on. So they should be able to say we have an epidemic in Guinea, in Sierra Leone and in Liberia. Just ahead, the conversation continues with Kofi Annan. We'll talk to him more about his time at the United Nations and if reforms are the key to the future of the organization. The structure of the Council today reflects the geopolitical realities of 1945 and the world has changed. Mr. Annan, you wrote your book, mm. We the Peoples, the United Nations for the 21st mm. Century, talking about reforms. What do you think is most urgently needed? I think one of the perhaps uh, important reforms would be the reform of the Security Council, because the structure of the Council today reflects the geopolitical realities of 1945, and the world has changed and the UN has to change uh, with it. Uh, and today you have uh, some big countries, very successful uh, countries, who would want to be part of decision making, who would want to be there. I'm not even saying take away the vetoes, but at least have other permanent members or other countries uh, on, around the table, because it is extremely difficult to explain to a country like India, which has about one-fifth or the world's population is not there. Latin America doesn't have a single permanent seat. Africa with 54 countries, which we referred to earlier, doesn't have a, they don't have a single uh, permanent seat. And yet, Europe has several. You know, how, how do you expect that uh, to accept? And, you know, and so some of these uh, changes are uh, extremely important. 
And what I'm also pleased about is that the UN is focusing more and more on economic issues because uh, there had been a tendency to focus on political conflicts and crisis. But there, there are economic basis, economic uh, grounds for conflict. Can you understand that people have, have lost faith in the United Nations and, and the effectiveness of, of what they can do? And can you blame them? The, the UN does a lot for the world. Um, I don't think the UN tells a story as effectively mm. as it should. Unfortunately, we tend to focus on the UN for the impossible crisis. Why can't the UN stop uh, Daesh or ISIS? Why can't the UN bring peace in the Middle East? These are you know, very, very hard issues. And even then, when we say the UN, we are really talking about our countries. So the UN is your government and my government. I remember years ago, I was invited to give a lecture at Columbia University. And the professor asked me, what are you going to speak about? So I sent him a brief note that my topic would be, the UN is us. So when I got there, he said, Kofi has uh, suggested he will speak about a very intriguing topic. The UN is the US. I said, no, no, us, us, not the US. <laughs> <laughs> Must have felt like that though, a lot of times. Though. In Washington this week, the Senate will hold hearings on the United Nations Oil for Food program that was supposed to help provide humanitarian aid to Iraq. In 2005, amid UN Secretary General Kofi Annan's comprehensive and controversial reforms, investigative reports surrounding bribery at the organization's Iraq Oil for Food program were released. In March, it was revealed the then Secretary General's son, Kojo Annan, had been employed by Swiss-based Kotechna, a company embroiled in the scandal, and there were significant questions over his integrity. Serious allegations have been made, and as you, as you know, we in this house are taking measures to strengthen our own administration and transparency. It was a move that saw calls for Annan to stand down, despite being cleared of all allegations of wrongdoing. Was there ever a time that you felt you wanted to resign? One of the lowest points mm -hmm. maybe being the, mm -hmm. the, the oil for food scandal and your, your yeah. son Kojo's no, involvement. I, I, no, I, I was. In fact, I, the, the question came, I said, that's the easy thing to do. Because when you have dark forces who deliberately invent uh, a scandal, they do it to themselves in their politics and all. Uh, you shouldn't give them the pleasure. Uh, of uh, doing that. So I, I did not consider resigning. I was disappointed by their behavior. Uh, it is tough, it's difficult, but you have to take it and carry on. When you left in 2006, you went away to become anonymous uh, with your <laughs> wife <laughs> in Lake Como and take some time yeah. off. But somebody recognized you or thought it was... was... We, yeah, no, it's true. Uh, you know the story. No, we, we borrowed a friend's house uh, uh, near Lake Como, which was adjacent to the forest, so that we can often go and walk in the forest uh, incognito, not bothered. And we had thought we would stay there for three months. No television, no radio, no newspapers. And after six weeks, I was beginning to get bored. So I told my wife, let's go and see if we can get a paper at the tobacconist. So we walked in, and within minutes, a group of men at the corner staring at us. And one of them broke away and started walking towards us. So I said to Nan, we have six weeks to go and we've blown our cover. How do we manage the village? By then the fellow was on top of me and he put his hand out and said, Morgan Freeman, <laughs> may I have an autograph? <laughs> so I said, sure. <laughs> I signed Kay Freeman, he was happy and we were happy and continued our holidays incognito. Has Morgan Freeman been asked for your autograph? <laughs> He knows the story, but it's possible. <laughs> Still to come from our discussion with Kofi Annan at the One Young World Conference in Dublin, we asked the global leader about his hopes for a brighter future for new generations 
and if he himself has any plans to slow down. When people ask me, I tell them I'm pruning, I'm not adding. <laughs> so it's begun. After more than 50 years in public service, former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan has turned his attention to the next generation. In 2013, the 74-year-old joined One Young World, an organization that brings together influential mentors and young leaders to formulate new ideas for issues facing the global community. They're the most educated, most informed, most connected generation in human history. And we just figured we would do good work to try to bring them together. It's about leadership. It's about young leaders coming and being able to have exchanges with more experienced people who've done a lot perhaps, but who actually need to encourage and mentor and share and listen to young people. And it's this experience and influence that leaves the young people themselves feeling inspired. It gives me an opportunity to be a messenger to the world to know about the, how my people are suffering. So I feel very big obligation. It's not just about my story, it's a people's story. There is an inspiring uh, journey when we say the name Kofi Annan. So today, this is an opportunity for me as a Palestinian young leader to deliver the message of uh, my peers in Palestine. Having here this interpersonal interactions, it breaks stereotypes, and to see the, the, the nuances of people acting on the ground. The specific examples that he has is phenomenal, and he takes it back to our responsibility as young people. And it's that sense of responsibility the leaders hope will have a real impact right across the globe. I think they should take away the fact that if they don't do it, who will? If they don't affect the change, how will that happen? But also that they have the power to do it. We hear throughout the year from them, or from all over the world, going, I was there, I heard Desmond Tutu, I heard Kofi Annan, and look what I did now. And, and that's what it's about. It's sort of like coming out of a warm bath for these people. At the end, they suddenly realize what they've agreed to do. And he really does um, move the league. Thank you. Mr. Annan, we're here at One Young World. How are you going to be able to help the young generation who are here seeking mm. your leadership mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. advice? Mm -hmm. I, I think one thing the young people have to know is that um, um, they are the leaders of the 21st century. They're going to have to run their countries and this world and that um, they should begin to get involved early. Uh, they are lucky. They are not growing at a time like mine where a child was to be seen and not to be heard. But they have to also understand that to get effective change and real change and sustained change, they have to be the change they want to see. And uh, they can only be that change if they throw themselves in. You're also chairing the elders, mm -hmm. and you have the Kofi Annan Foundation. Mm -hmm. So day to day, what does your life entail? It, it's busy. Uh, it, it is uh, busy. I have the elders, I have the foundation, and we do a lot of work on uh, reconciliation, on governance, on the importance of elections, and um, giving advice and assistant governments on some of the reconciliation issues that they are dealing with. I believe whenever one can tackle the root causes and ask the deep, painful, difficult questions. In fact, it was after I went through Srebrenica, Rwanda, Iraq, and others that uh, I started pushing the idea of uh, responsibility to protect, which uh, the UN eventually adopted in 2005. You've won the Nobel Peace Prize. What would you like your legacy to be? I think I'd be happy if my legacy were to be that uh, uh, when, when he left the UN, the UN worked a little better 
and he made their efforts to help the underdog and the underprivileged. And just finally, would you ever consider slowing down? <laughs> I will have to consider, sl uh, consider slowing down or it will be done for me. So I will, I will consider slowing down and uh, uh, I'm beginning to prune. So when people ask me, I tell them I'm pruning, I'm not adding. <laughs> so it's begun. Okay. Mr. Anand, thank you so thank much you. for your time Good. today. Such okay. a pleasure. Thanks. That's it for our exclusive discussion with Kofi Annan from the One Young World Summit here in Dublin. Be sure to join in the discussion by emailing us conversations at cnbc.com or tweeting at cnbcworld. Until next time, I'm Tanya Breyer.